the American Te Art Association podcast features conversations and interviews which explore the life, thought, and vision of mystic scientist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. We express our gratitude to Dalesford Abbey in Paoli, Pennsylvania for allowing us to use their space and equipment in making this episode possible. Dr. Thomas E. Legere has been a university professor, author, and psychotherapist for 35 years. A former member of the American Psychological Association and fellow in the American Association of Pastoral Counselors, he has lectured on three continents on how to build bridges between psychology and spirituality. He is the author of three books and over 400 journal, magazine, and newspaper articles. Dr. Legere has experience in pastoral counseling, developmental psychology, dream work, addiction studies, the psychology of religion, and transpersonal psychology. Welcome, everyone, to the American Teilhard Association podcast, and welcome, Dr. Tom Legere. Tom, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. Happy to be with you today, uh, as well as with all those folks who might be watching from all over this beautiful world of ours. Uh, may our time together today be not just informational, but transformational. That's right. And um, I should mention that I'm very grateful for Tom coming out to the Abbey today where we record these podcasts. It's a beautiful day. It's quite a warm day, so we've got a fan here in the studio with us to kind of keep us cool. Um, but um, we're really grateful for his time, for his presence. And uh, this is especially um, meaningful for me as Tom is the person who directed me towards Terre de Chardin. Wow. So I would, cert- not, would not be here today, certainly, without you. So Ooh. this means a lot today. So, Tom, let's get into it. How yes, did you <clears throat> and Teilhard first meet? And, and so when and where did you meet? <clears throat> Good question. Um, I was about 31 and a half years of age uh, when I had my spiritual awakening. And this coincided with me pursuing a master's degree at Fordham University in spirituality. And the first person who saved me at a point where I realized I didn't know anything, uh, was Carl Jung. I could talk with you some other time about him. But the next summer, I found out about this man called Teilhard de Chardin. And as probably almost everybody who's (laughs) looking today, lights went off. And I realized here was somebody who finally had brought together science, and spirituality. And I was fortunate that uh, one of my teachers at that time was, are you ready for this, Thomas Burry. Wow. So, wow, what a way to start. Sure. And another person in that class, indirectly as a result of me being led to his work, was another person that you and our listeners are familiar with, I'm sure, and that is Lou Savory. Of course, our last podcast guest. All right, so a shout out to you, Lou. I'm sure you don't remember who I was, but as a relatively young man, uh, that was extremely important to me. So Teilhard's vision just absolutely captured me. And to kind of demonstrate uh, how thoroughly he had captured me, I went out to the site of his burial, uh, which is out at an old Jesuit seminary along the Hudson River. Mm -hmm. And at that time, this place had been sold, and it was now the Culinary Institute of America, which it still is. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's not that far off, because they're teaching people how to be nourished Mm -hmm. physically and here was a man who taught people how to be nourished mentally and spiritually. Mm-hmm. So I asked the security guy uh, for the key to the cemetery. And he says, oh, I know who you're looking for. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. that old Jesuit priest. And I said, yeah, that's, that's the guy. Yep. So I went out to his um, place of rest in the cemetery. Mm-hmm. And I thought of a number of things. One is that when he passed away, they had the funeral out there. Mm. 
but they weren't even allowing the Jesuit seminarians to attend. Okay. I guess they were afraid they might be contaminated by him. Even know? after death. Even okay. after death. And one of the great stories, uh, perhaps you know this one too, it's like his ego couldn't care less about this, but they misspelled his name really? on his tombstone. I didn't know that. Yeah. So uh, they had to eventually put a new head on the, right. the tomb. How about that? Can you believe this? So in that sense, it wasn't that hard to find them because right. it was one of the newer uh, additions to the cemetery. And I just stood there and I identified with him because at that point, I was paying a personal price for a spiritual awakening, as everyone does mm -hmm. who follows that universal Christ path. Mm -hmm. It's part of what Jesus went through when he's being mocked and spit upon mm -hmm. and ridiculed. And I thought, here was this great guy right. who never did anything bad, but everybody was so afraid of him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I thought of that, and then I thought of what a genius he was. It's almost like a Mozart. Where does somebody like this come from? They're like a fluke. You can't say that, well, so-and-so taught him to be this way. He right. just rose up as a genius with his own insights. And spontaneously then, you ready for this? Don't mm -hmm. get scared. I laid down prostrate mm -hmm. uh, right on top of his grave. And I put my arms out in a cruciform yeah. fashion. Yeah. And I both thanked him and I asked for his guidance as I would go about the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. So it was quite a dramatic introduction. So it was about, I guess I was maybe 32 and a half okay. at that point. So okay. it's not a bad time, by the way, to have a connection. <laughs> a pretty um, <clears throat> providential time, we might say. Jesus, 30. Um, Augustine, 30, um, so many other folks around that time. St. Francis of Assisi, too, was a little bit older, right? Uh, actually, to be accurate there, he was a little bit younger. He okay. was only like 27. Really? Okay. Which is pretty young for having a spiritual awakening. But most people, it doesn't happen until 40 or so in our culture. But there I was. So... Uh, he came into my life at that day, and I can say that he's never left. <laughs> I think about him every day. Right. And it's not so much just about him, because he's just the medium. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the message That's right. that really has energized me over the years. That's right. Because it's not mm -hmm. like he discovered the Omega Point. No. That has always been and always will be. He, in some way, put a language to it that we're able to work with today. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In that sense, um, he was, as I sort of see myself in a tiny way, uh, being a, a translator. He just came upon something. He understood what it yes. meant. Mm -hmm. And he dedicated the rest of his life to trying to communicate it. But you're right. He, he didn't discover it. In a sense, the insights that he has go back to the perennial philosophy right. that goes back not just to the time of Jesus or the time of Moses, mm -hmm. but even the ancient Egyptians. That's right. So it was from the beginning of Homo sapiens mm -hmm. about 30 million years ago right. that people started to think the way he did. Mm -hmm. But he brought it to another level for our times. Yeah, and when you think back to, like, for example, you say the Egyptians. The Egyptians are known for their hieroglyphics, pyramids, yes. mythologies, yes. elaborate sarcophagi, and things like that, right? Within their cultural context, that communicated to them that cosmic consciousness. And then we have Teilhard for the 21st century, using his own language of science and mysticism yes. to communicate these fundamental truths that have always been. So, 
Thank you for uh, sure. that, that very intimate story going back yeah. into your, your uh, first encountering <laughs> Teilhard and coming to know him more. So over all these years, how has your understanding <clears throat> of his vision evolved? Like you said, you think of him every day. So from the time that you first encountered him and started to process his thought yeah. up until now, how was that evolution taking place? Yeah, as you say, until now, because I'm sitting out in my car this morning thinking, what's the latest insight that I have from him? Because I keep getting them. So at the time, I was just a man who, again, knew nothing. So I was like a blank slate. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I learned from him uh, were the different stages of evolution. That's right. The barosphere, the lithosphere, the biosphere, the atmosphere, etc., mm -hmm. which many of our folks are familiar with. And then at the end, uh, leading to the Christosphere. Mm -hmm. Okay, But at the beginning, I didn't fully understand how the two blended together. I saw them almost as building blocks. Mm -hmm. You know, the one thing led to the next, and then we build upon that. Mm -hmm. But again, this is the, something the mystics have always known, you know, St. John, in, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Christ, the presence of God, has been there from every moment of evolution mm -hmm. in its own way. It's fully manifested in a different way, in the human. That's right. But it's given me such an appreciation uh, of nature, for example, mm -hmm. which I didn't have at that time. Okay. I was living in my head. Mm -hmm. And now, mm -hmm. every time I see a tree, I'll just think about that, or a bird, or a fish, or a leaf, or a plant. And to realize all of that was part of what some had called the first revelation. Right. You know, the second revelation that Christians talk about mm -hmm. is Jesus with uh, the scriptures and uh, tradition, etc. But to think that way exclusively is to say, well, God wasn't doing anything uh, for the first, let's say, 14 and a half billion years. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. There's just this vacuum. Yeah of big history, of deep time. Yep, and mm -hmm. Teilhard, that's another beautiful thing when you think about he helps us think in such large terms. Right. You know, when you're coming from the ego, as I was at the time, mm -hmm. I saw things in a myopic kind of a way. Okay. Uh, but when you realize, for example, with Christianity, it's only been around... 2,000 years. Mm. That is nothing right. when you compare it to 14 and a half billion years. Right. Even if you look at the Vedic <clears throat> traditions, for example, they go back <clears throat> way longer than the Christian tradition. So how could that truth still not be present within some grain of consciousness, even within that tradition? Right. Absolutely. And it always has been. And we'll talk maybe a little bit later about a quibble that I have with Teilhard concerning that. Okay. But I think your, your insight is correct. Let me just share one little tiny anecdote mm -hmm. uh, that told me that this is the way things were going to be heading in my life. The very first book I picked up in theology, now there could have been all kinds of fundamental books this one jumped off the table to me, hmm. and it was called The Unknown Christ of Hinduism. Hmm. And I remember my first thought was, what? Here's Christ. Mm -hmm. He's a Christian. What does that have to do with Hinduism? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this is the thinking of a small-minded person at the time. But... Uh, that's the way he opened my mind all the time. So the big picture mm -hmm. and uh, how science and spirituality are inextricably connected. That's right. That's right. And <clears throat> even that title, The Unknown Christ, Christ 
of Hinduism. Yes. The title in itself is like <clears throat> something to meditate, right? The unknown Christ of a different religion. Yes. <laughs> yes. And but Teilhard's the guy who <clears throat> provides us with a language and content that is suitable to address those types of things. Especially when we get into which we'll you know touch on a little bit in our next question mm -hmm. uh, going forward, but the real internal component of it all, yes. like the what some <clears throat> might call mysticism, but looking at it from a bit more of a scientist, if you will, point of view, as okay. like a psychologist, you know, okay. and looking at the different dynamics that's happening. There's so much to unpack there um, within our own inner journey, right? that Teilhard can, as a Christian, and as people coming from a Christian background, give us that language to work with. Okay. For something that was maybe unknown before. But. Very good. And, uh, you know, this is so exciting to me yeah, to be able to too. talk about this. So, yeah, we look at Jesus for people who follow the great teacher for the spiritual message. And uh, people like myself look at Carl Jung, mm who could explain things psychologically. But then there's Teilhard, who comes at the same perennial philosophy, but from a different point of view. Right. And in terms of the way I see the world, uh, this is very important. In fact, every day in my meditation, I generally try to meditate about a half an hour a day. I know some do it longer, some shorter. But I start off with kind of the scientific point of view. Like, who am I? And, okay, quickly I realized that I'm more than this person that people call Tom Legere. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm made out of star stuff. <laughs> you know? Right. So, it's true. And matter is neither created nor destroyed. Okay, so in some ways, I am 15 billion years old. All right, and all right, we got that established. <laughs> and where did I come from? Well, I came from the stars, so I've been around a long time. And, uh, you know, the next part I look at is okay, um, I'm, besides my skin, I go below and I see tissue and bones and organs. Mm -hmm. And this is all happening real quickly sure. as I zero in on a meditation. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, all of that, they're made up of cells. The cells are made up of atoms. The atoms are made up of neutrons, protons, and electrons. Mm -hmm. And those are made up of quarks, mm. which are random patterns of energy. Mm -hmm. So I look at myself as not being solid. And uh, people in physics understand that. And Teilhard did as a paleontologist. That's he, right. he understood uh, that things have different levels to them. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is just fantastic. And then finally I get, okay, so I'm more than all those things. Well, who am I? I'm, I'm the light. You know, not me with my ego, but me as a manifestation. That's right. If I can get out of the way, in fact, mm -hmm. then I'm God shining through. That's right. So th that's the kind of thing that Teilhard can lead you to. And in an atomized world that we live in, where people think that they're individuals, these solid egos walking mm -hmm. upon the earth... No wonder we're in such trouble today. Right. That's true. And without Teilhard, it's like, how could we describe ourselves as being a manifestation of quantum energy that is expressing yes. the love of the Creator, right? But with someone like him in his mind and the words that he gives us to work with, it's like, oh, well, that's not so far-fetched, right? That doesn't seem too woo-woo. No, it is not. It seems quite scientific in a way. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, I remember, this is purely an anecdote, uh, seeing something somewhere. As a teacher, I'm always stealing things from sure. different people unapologetically. And this person had, I think, 20 different statements on a piece of paper. Ten were by mystics, mm -hmm. and ten were by modern scientists okay. who came from 
physics. Right. And the little game was figure out who's talking, a mystic or a scientist. That's pretty good. And you really couldn't tell. Right. Yeah. It's true. And as we probe the mm. unknown, how is that different from a scientist doing that now and someone back in a monastery in the Middle Ages in their cell? Right. Yes. Entering deep into that infinite space of prayer in the same way that like just this coming Saturday, we're going to have the ATA event with the uh, Vatican astronomers. They're going to be talking about what we see Ooh. in the sky, right? In the uh, the infinite uh, area of space that is beyond this, right? So yeah. it's like two ends of the spectrum talking about the same thing in a way. That, yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, you had talked about yeah. um, like seeing Teilhard through different lenses, through different levels. Now, as a psychologist... How do you understand <clears throat> Teilhard's explanation of spiritual evolution? Okay. That one, to me, is easy. That one's spiritual side mm -hmm. is the natural mm -hmm. unfolding mm -hmm. of who we are. It is not a superimposition. Mm -hmm. It's not like, well, okay, we have psychology that's here, and we also have solid spirituality. Right. No. <laughs> You are not fully opened up psychologically right. <clears throat> until and unless you have access to spiritual dimension. That's right. So uh, psychology uh, and spirituality, they just, they have to be together. Mm. You're doing yourself an injustice if you exclude one or the other. Right. And unfortunately, there's still a lot of that out there. Yeah. That, um, and I'll just tell you my little two cents uh, explanation for that. I think there's still a confusion, believe it or not, in a lot of people's minds between religion and spirituality. And a lot of uh, psychologists um, see what they experience as the danger that certain forms of misguided religion sure. have done to people. Sure. Therefore, they don't want to hear about it. Right. But spirituality is, is something you know, completely different. So to me, they, they absolutely don't just blend together, but they arise from the deeper levels. Okay. Or you could start with the fact uh, that we start off as spiritual, mm -hmm. and then that part of us gets hidden and lost, mm. and then the spiritual journey is about rediscovering that's right what we have lost that's right t.s Eliot says and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time mm. <laughs> it's so true and, <clears throat> and having little kids like you know my children are little oh. um <clears throat> there is this light that shines through them Yes. That's so such an advanced consciousness where the answers, I mean, they're kids at the end of the day, but the answers they give you sometimes to questions or mm -hmm. that I ask them or questions they ask us, they're just so profound. Insights they might have, ways of describing the world. Yes. It's like, wow, how do you get it so well? And then in the next moment, they revert back to being five years old or whatever. But you mm -hmm. see how there is a frequency that we're tuned into from the start. Yes. And I mean, I would argue that like, yeah, like you said, mm -hmm. um, probably that's the closest we are before death is, you know, at birth and just having left that world in a way of unconscious of just that total union with mother, yes. which for all we know at the time is God. Of course. Right? In, of course. That, in that uh, fetal state. <clears throat> right. And then trauma happens, life happens, the imperfections of our parents get projected on us and yes. imprinted, and, and life, ha right, it unfolds. Mm -hmm. The ego forms a type of callus over us. Yes, it does. And then there mm -hmm. is, this kind of goes back to your, uh, the first question I asked you about meeting Teilhard and kind of this tenuous period you were moving through in a spiritual awakening. We find that, and this is something that you taught me once, that one of the price tags of authenticity is anxiety. Sure. Of having to pass through instability, like it says in Tarot's prayer, patient trust, right? Yes. God guiding us through those periods of instability and unknown. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's neat being on that end now with having the kids <laughs> being so little, being able to have them express themselves in such a way that 
I am just blown away and reaffirm that that connection is so implicit within our lives that mm-hmm. it's only something we fall out of. Yes. And then, like you said, return back to, to know for the very first time. Yes. And uh, the artists among us mm-hmm. have always known this. Mm-hmm. Think of all the paintings, especially during the Renaissance period, where people are kneeling down before the infant, right. before the little child. That's right. This is the Christ self within us all. Mm-hmm. Think of the symbolism of the three magi. That's right. right? There's, uh, we don't know that they really, it doesn't make any sense that they were there on uh, the night of the birth of Christ. But the symbolism of these three uh, intellectuals, mm-hmm. scientists, for example, mm-hmm. um, and intellectuals kneeling down before a little baby. You know, that's it. That's what you're talking about. Right. That in a sense, your little children mm-hmm. can be your teachers. Yeah. People laugh because a lot of times they're reminding you of parts of yourself that you have forgotten about. So true. So true. Yeah. Now, you had just mentioned a couple words in those last couple <clears throat> questions I asked you that I'd like you to just uh, define here for our listeners. Sure. And that's really what is the difference between, sp- or I'm sorry, psyche <clears throat> and spirit. Okay. Because, you know, I'm, I'm using <clears throat> this language of, we both use it in spirituality, and then we've talked about mysticism in reference to Teilhard. But just to be technical for a moment here. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Technical but simple. That's right. All right. So the word psyche in Greek. Mm-hmm. It means soul. Okay, so we could also be asking ourselves, what's the difference between the soul and the spirit? Mm -hmm. They're two different things. Mm -hmm. The soul is the package that holds the totality of who we are. The spirit is one dimension of that. So, trying to... Uh, just lay this out in the simple terminology. It's not as if the body has a soul. Mm-hmm. No, the soul has a body. Mm-hmm. And uh, therefore, the soul of ours contains, first of all, this physical solid dimension of ours, and mm-hmm. the body has its own memory. Right. And then a second level, there's only four that we're going to talk about, uh, represents the mental part of who we are. And that would be our current thinking and awareness. That's all part of our soul work. Mm -hmm. The easily retrievable contents Mm -hmm. of the psyche. If I ask you, you know, what high school did you go to? Oh, okay, I can go back to that. You know, boom. I pushed a button and the computer brought that back. That's from the soul. Mm -hmm. But then there's a deeper dimension uh, called the unconscious. Mm. And uh, how do we access that? Because it wants to be heard. So it will come up often through our dreams, Mm -hmm. interpreted symbolically, as well as other symbols that oftentimes good religion Mm -hmm. will give people. Mm -hmm. So a a good religion will be filled with archetypes Mm -hmm. that represent uh, those primordial patterns inside the psyche. And then the fourth and final part represents what human beings have called the divine spark. Mm -hmm. That's what the uh, Rhineland mystics like Meister Eckhart Mm -hmm. used to call it. Mm -hmm. Um, So it is is that uh, pure experience of our inner essence. So to kind of sum this up, uh, you have to find that soul within the psyche. Mm -hmm. This is where the journey takes place. Mm -hmm. And... And of course, Jesus, who knew everything, he spoke about that. Uh, he calls about that 
he calls that, for example, the treasure buried in the field. Mm -hmm. The field is the unconscious, mm -hmm. but the treasure is the spark of God. Right. Okay. Also calls it the lost coin. Mm -hmm. The pearl of great price. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah you got it. You <laughs> got it. So uh, that's how I see it. Uh, so you may be doing a lot of good soul work, mm -hmm. working on childhood issues mm -hmm. and things like that and lack of forgiveness and all that. That's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you're really quite doing spiritual work mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. Unless implicitly you say, well, okay, God is in everything, so God is in those kinds of issues too. Sure, but sure. you know what we're talking about. Having a spiritual experience is That's right. an awakening to who you have always been, yeah. but you didn't realize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is maybe you know more fodder for another conversation, but um, I've noticed that within <clears throat> the... Um, uh, call it, um, and it will, so, so psychosynthesis, right, yes. is, you know, the school of thought from Roberto Assagioli, and um, Assagioli, where Jung was not willing to say that our psychological <laughs> development is a spiritual process, Assagioli <clears throat> affirmed that, no, they're, they're one and the same, they're happening complementary with one another, right, and mm -hmm. um, there's been, it seems like there's a lot of soul work that's being advertised for people to do to get in touch with their anima or animos or shadow work and things like that, right? And the mm -hmm. childhood things. But I wonder where the spirituality is within that. And again, this is like popular psychology that's being put out there yes. today. So, of course, that comes and goes. But okay. if anything, it's maybe affirming to see that there is a push to delve back into these deeper levels to integrate into self in a model that um, <clears throat> holds the validity of our spirituality and spiritual lives, right? Where, mm -hmm. uh, what is, you'll correct me on this, but um, it was psychology first lost its soul, right? Mm -hmm. With uh, with Freud, right. right? And then with, was it Skinner and the behavioralists? Mm -hmm. It lost its mind yes. and just becoming something that was <clears throat> neurological behavioral right so it, it's just interesting to see that shift within culture and i think too people mm -hmm. are generally beyond those who are doing any sort of personal work um they're seeking mm -hmm. meaning they're seeking purpose they're seeking community that's right yeah and it may not always be that deep mm -hmm. but jesus again those who are not against us are with us right okay so he didn't insist on people being enlightened mm -hmm. before he spoke to them. Sure. He took them where they were. That's right. And he tried to use simple examples, like parables. Very well said. So uh, everybody's looking. You know, uh, I remember a famous quote by uh, G.K. Chesterton. Uh, it's a kind of an earthy mm -hmm. quote, but he said, the young man who is knocking on the door of a brothel is looking for God, but he doesn't know it. Sure. So we have a lot of strange yeah. things out there, mm -hmm. people calling it soul work, mm -hmm. some of it much more valid and deeper than others. But we can at least applaud the effort yeah. if it's trying to take people beyond their ego. Yes. That's a start. If yes. it doesn't do that, <laughs> then it's going backwards. That's a good point. That's an excellent point. Yeah. So... And having said all that, uh, you have a gift of being able to explain Teilhard's very mm. complex thought and concepts in a very direct and simple way. So is this a skill that has been innate within you, that has just grown over the years, or is this something that you've had to work to perfect? <laughs> Thank you. Is that the answer right there? Well, <laughs> well yes and no. I remember yeah. one of my students one time after class, this is graduate psychology, mm -hmm. She came up and she said, you know, Professor, she said, I have a feeling that you work very, very hard to make things very, very simple. Mm. And I thought to myself, well, I appreciate the compliment, but it isn't true. I've just always had that gift. And one of the aspects of that gift, and it may sound like I'm being facetious here, is I'm not that much of an intellectual. <laughs> I'm not that smart, but I have great intuition. Mm -hmm. I can just pick up the big picture. That's right. 
and explain it in simple terminology. Uh, my wife kids me. She says, you can pick up the book of somebody who has written some complicated stuff. You can look at the back cover and come up with a lecture on it, and it's pretty good. <laughs> so I, I don't know how, you know, this has happened. But uh, one thing I've learned, uh, and I told my students this all the time in psychology, is everybody is created differently. Mm -hmm. And never try to be somebody that you're not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a person like Teilhard, so smart, so brilliant. Mm -hmm. I don't even try to be like him. Right. I'm, I'm not a great researcher. I don't have a lot of original thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my friends said, uh, you've never had an original thought in your life. I thought, Maybe. And then they added on to that, and you've probably never had an unwritten thought in your life either, <laughs> maybe. But what I've accepted here is that I have a gift from God of being a translator. Mm. I don't know where this came from. But to me, I always get the point of what somebody is saying, mm. and then I can explain it to somebody. And my students just, you know, they're always looking for what my secret was and how mm -hmm. I did it. And, you know, I think back to uh, St. Paul when this question was being raised in the early church. And he said, you know, are all teachers, are all healers, mm -hmm. are all administrators? Right. So do what you're good at. And... You know, I'm just a simple teacher. But you pay a price sometimes mm -hmm. for things like that. Like in academia, mm -hmm. um, I've been criticized uh, by colleagues, for example. Oh, you don't have many footnotes mm -hmm. in your books. And uh, it's true. It's because this is my book. <laughs> it's not being arrogant because I just see it the way I see it and mm -hmm. I put it out there and people don't say you're wrong they often say to me though it's too simple the way you put it there <laughs> so if that's the case I fall back on God I plead guilty but my students seem to love it and I can sleep at night because I'm not trying to put on a false face and pretend to be somebody that I'm not. And hey, what's true is true is true across the board. Right. So it doesn't matter if you say it with 10, 100 footnotes or right. one footnote that cites scripture, right? That's as, right. as your one source. Because what more do you need than that? And the great you know, teachers uh, had no problem with this, uh, giving examples. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you think about you know Jesus, here we go with Jesus again, because he, he to me is the ultimate spiritual teacher there's no example once in the scriptures of him giving a big metaphysical presentation that's right he's not even having the kind of conversation that you and i yeah. are having right now what's the most complex he gets the <laughs> sermon on the mount maybe that's something right. like that that's about it yeah. and even that it's all metaphor yeah and you know the theologians want to go deeper than that but he understood that if a metaphor is good enough, then you can have people from first grade to postgraduate mm. who can hear the story That's right. and understand it on the level that they're at. And I think, too, that when you speak with greater simplicity to something that is a ubiquitous universal experience, <clears throat> that's going to hit on a level that speaking at a high level of academic proficiency would just never hit with people. Exactly. Well, you can relate to people, like you said, where they are and <clears throat> use a language that is both uh, digestible and acceptable yes. because when we get into this language of spirituality and stuff, especially <clears throat> with religion, then something a little different, those words have a lot of baggage with some people. And mm -hmm. they have triggers and then they psychologically shut down mm -hmm. and it's very difficult then to, depending yes. on what the interaction is, you know, advance that. But um, yeah, and I think too about how you talk about having this intuition, mm -hmm. right? 
Now, Tara talks about vision, not our eyesight, mm. but mm -hmm. in order for us to survive as a species, or any species to survive, yes. it needs to be able to <clears throat> see. Now, you know, uh, it's having a greater vision of the world, having yeah. a greater conceptualization of it, a greater intuition of how everything is connected and comes together. Yeah. And that is that evolutionary trait, we might call it, that yeah. gives us that leg up, so to speak. Yeah. Just one comment on something you said before, and then I'd like to comment on what you just said here. Mm -hmm. Somebody had said, that which is most personal is also most universal. Mm. So I use plenty of personal examples. And again, my colleagues don't do that. <laughs> you know, yeah. oh, that's just your anecdotal uh, experience with things. Okay. But... Um, the other thing you had just mentioned was, what did you say there at the end? What were we talking about? Uh, the uh, Oh, vision. About, oh, the vision yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I hope he's right. Mm -hmm. I, whew, the faith that he has, uh, it's, it, it's trying to me. Sure. Uh, because he believes... Uh, that God would not have brought us this far mm -hmm. if we were not almost predestined mm -hmm. to awaken universally mm -hmm. to the Christosphere or the Theosphere. Mm -hmm. But then I look at things like <laughs> in a country in the United States where there's 300 and some million people mm -hmm. We have 400 million guns. Mm -hmm. When I look at a world where people are still saber rattling, mm. not like in the old days with sabers, right, right. but with nuclear weapons, right. it does cause me concern. And those people are <clears throat> displaying signs of psychopathy like across the board. Yes. Too. <laughs> it's like, That's how it's interconnected yeah, because... Yeah. As the, as the poet says, the center does not hold. Mm. And with people in the past, at least religion seemed to do something to hold people together. Yeah. But we live in kind of a post-religious time right now in mm. which all religions seem to be crumbling in terms of their current forms anyway. Right. So people are just lost mm. out there. Yeah. So you have you know many unbalanced people, to put yeah. it, Mildly, sure. mildly, who are who are playing around with very dangerous weapons. And right. Those weapons can be everything. Yes, from nuclear weapons to uh, the blogosphere. Right. Yeah. Um, I was going to say policy, yeah, but yeah, absolutely. You know, Even you know what is put out there in terms of content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I pray for your little children. I really do, and I'm sure you do every day too. I do, and I just can't help but think that they're meant to be here at a time like this and that you and I are meant to be here at a time like this, you know, and that we come together and you transfer knowledge to me and I transfer knowledge to them and it just continues on that way. Very good point. And uh, I had mentioned meeting Thomas Burry uh, during my graduate uh, days. Here's another person uh, I got to meet, uh, Gene Houston. Okay who is just, you know, a phenomenal person. Look her up if you don't know who Two she people is. people who knew Teilhard. They knew him. Yeah. And here's what her take on this is. And I, I've been holding on to this. She said that we are, us human beings today, mm -hmm. the people of the parenthesis. And here's what she meant by that. Okay. That the old vision, vision has clearly crumbled yeah. or is gasping for breath. Mm -hmm. But we don't have a clear new vision yet. Mm. So we are the people of the parenthesis. And Jean said, God must love us and trust us very much because we have been put at this tenuous period. Yeah in which we have to let the old go mm -hmm. and give birth to the new. Mm -hmm. So have courage. 
Yeah, and it takes me back to when you know the great uh, unknown of that unknown time of COVID, where you know we're out of it now. We know a lot more fact from fiction and whatnot. But like at that time when everyone was kind of freaking out, no one knew what was going on. I heard someone bring up the point of like this is apocalyptic, right? Quite a few people were bringing up that, you know. And um, then I heard someone say, "Well, the apocalypse doesn't mean the end; it means the great revealing or an uncovering." And I think it was, um, I think it was an artist I was listening to talk about this, lo and behold, right? Um, who is saying that, and we are all in different stages of that apocalypse where some of us are just mourning the loss of the old world. Some of us are clinging to it, trying to keep those structures in place in this new world that's forming. Yes. Others of us are breaking down the old world while others of us are building up that new world and doing that work. So it's happening all at once. And I think that's what causes the great um, collective anxiety yes. that we feel along mm-hmm. with just, you know, the <laughs> anxiety of being alive, but um, mm-hmm. to be able to shift one's focus, as it says, like in the cloud of unknowing, like looking mm-hmm. beyond the shoulders of that, which is in front of yes. you looking for God. It's kind of what I feel <clears throat> Teilhard is calling us to do. And mm-hmm. this is a question that I've, I've probed with some guests before um, mm-hmm. and uh, they kind of go back to like, how did he hope in a time like this? And the more mm-hmm. I explore this point yes. of view, I find the validity in it. It was really from his time in the war and how he experienced hell on earth from a perspective that had mm-hmm. never been uh, fathomed before. There were no Vietnam movies to watch or World War II movies. These were mm-hmm. machines of death being witnessed with human eyes for the first time. He's seeing this. Yet somehow he looks over the shoulders of that. And in the chaos of that destruction in hell on earth is actually when he starts to have this mystic, excuse me, this mystic unraveling, right? He's uh, experiencing Mm -hmm. all these uh, uh, visions and deeper insights into a cosmic future and a cosmic past and a cosmic present. Yes. And it's rattling him in a way where it's undoing his ego so as to be able to see this. And yes. as someone who's not been through an experience like that, I can only mm-hmm. imagine how trying it may be and to maintain. And I remember reading Teilhard about how he would keep like the Eucharist close to him because he felt yes. like if he were ever going to die, he would have Jesus with him and so forth and so on. Right. <clears throat> Whatever one's devotion is. That's right. How it can pull us through those times of darkness, whether they be personal, collective, communal. Yes, it's essential. Yes, yeah. and you know that brings out you know a simple point here that I have found to be universally true: that every spiritually enlightened individual that I've ever run into, the real deal, has gone through a kind of crucifixion. Yeah. I don't want to hear from anybody who has never experienced that. Right, and with. Tayard, yeah, it was being a chaplain uh, in World War One and a stretcher bearer, I believe, right? Yeah, the stretcher bearer. They stretcher wanted bearer. him to be a chaplain. Oh, and okay. And he said, no, I want to be at the front. Whatever is happening in evolution right now, I want to be at the front of that movement. Yes, okay, so beautiful. He, had, yeah, he declined that opportunity to maintain his priestly fa- Well, you know, as a, as a cleric serving in that way. But, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you look at a person like... Uh, Jung, not to get into that too much, but he went through a period of a couple of years oh, sure. in which people thought he was having a psychotic break. He built an entire new place to live because of it, yeah. Yeah, and when I was being torn apart uh, back in the uh, the mid-70s, um, I was experiencing a total disorientation, mm-hmm. a death of the ego, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Because, you know, as a young man, um, I identified with my ego mm-hmm. a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, Which my, is what we all... Yeah. And Jung would argue is what the, the, the first That's half true. of his life is for. That's true. Yeah. That's true. But on the other hand, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Right. And I needed to be hit over the head with a, a cosmic baseball bat in order for me to be the person that I am today. And every day of my life, I thank God for that experience. Mm -hmm. You know, this was mainly the summer of 1976 and a little bit beyond. 
And I remember even trying to explain what I was going through to some of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. And they looked at me almost like a side dish they didn't order. It's like, what is he talking about? Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, dear God, I hope I'm not going crazy here. But I needed to be stripped down totally yeah. before God could build me up again. Mm -hmm. So thank God Teilhard was there at that time in my life because I think if I had heard this maybe five years younger when I'm a 25-year-old hotshot who's got all the answers up in his head, I would have thought, oh, this is a really interesting theory here. Mm -hmm. You know, that's interesting. Now I can go out and give lectures on Teilhard. But to understand that he lived yeah. what he talked about. Right. And you could see it on his face. Mm -hmm. There was a piece there, but I always saw some kind of deep lines in his face. You know, he, he yeah. knew what it was like to be misunderstood. Sure. I mean, I'm sure you've gotten into this at other blogs, you know, sure. when you're being sent off by your religious order on a slow boat to China. Literally. <laughs> Exile to the desert. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, But like those desert monastics, he found God even more and even deeper and wider places than... With, with, that's what I say, within the dead rocks and bones, he found that living Christ that is within all life. Yeah, he did. He did. So that's what you know makes him such an extraordinary person mm -hmm. to me, uh, that he was, first of all, a world-class scientist. He yep. was a world-class paleontologist. Yep. At the University of Paris, is that where he was? Initially, or, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, other places as well. But he was, he was recognized uh, as a paleontologist. I think it was the um, the Catholic University of Paris. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay, good. So he had all that going, and he for was him. very popular as a young lecturer too, until they started to find out why he was so popular. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was different. He was a bridge builder. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you find out as a bridge builder, too, to anybody who's ever tried to be one, is nobody's happy with what you're saying because you're not planted solely on one side of the river. Right. You're not on the other side of the river. You're trying to build bridges. Mm -hmm. And that really is what the church is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the pope... Uh, was called the Pontifex Maximus, mm. you know, the great bridge builder. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, a lot of times we have not had the courage to be bridge builders. We wanted to stay on one side and stick into formulas. Mm -hmm. And here's here's Teilhard uh, trying to do what Pope John the Twenty Third said when he said, "The truth is one thing." How you express it is something else. Mm -hmm. But when you do that, oh, you're going to get pot shots yep. from both sides. Some people are going to say you're a heretic, uh, you're too radical. Other people are going to say uh, you're too traditional. <laughs> Why are you talking about God? Right. I was right. I was with you until you started talking about God and Christ. You know, you lost me there. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, that can be tough sometimes in navigating those waters. Um, but in terms of your own personal exploration of Teilhard, what would you say challenges you the most from his thought? Or you, you had mentioned before, too, there was one thing you wanted to address. Thanks for reminding sure. me of that. And, of course, as you can imagine, I do so with great fear and trembling because oh, yeah. I'm not worthy to carry his coat. But... And he would, he would say things differently, I think, today. It's been a long time since he's passed. And sure. we got to remember, I hope this doesn't sound condescending, but he wasn't allowed to be published. And most of us publish, we get criticized, yeah. we learn from that, and then next time out of the gate, we say it a little bit differently. Right. But I think he tended to be a little bit condescending towards Eastern religions. Hmm. I, I think he gave them kind of short shrift. Okay. And he focused uh, on the fact that in his mind, they didn't take the world seriously enough. Hmm. I think that's the simple way to put it. Sure. sure. He said, that's why they're kind of poor, and that's why, 
you know, their, their tradition is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't take the world seriously enough. Right. But I think that's a, you know, kind of a misreading of uh, where they're coming from. And I don't think he, he had enough of a grasp uh, of the Eastern religions. How can you expect a guy to know everything? You yeah, know, I mean, yeah. so, you know, he might not have known about Brahman and Vishnu and Shiva, and Vishnu is the equivalent of Christ. Mm -hmm. If he would have focused on that, he could have built more bridges, but he tended to just dismiss it and focus on the Christian version, at, at least in Europe. Yeah. And... You know, I, I think somebody else needs to do that work. And he was at a time when religious dia interreligious dialogue was just uh, in its like infancy, just becoming, you know, just being born in a way. Yes. Like, you know, really think like Merton was someone who advanced that within the Christian tradition with the East. Yes. But um, in terms of Teilhard, he didn't have like a name who's come up a couple times today in our own conversation, the Carl Jung's. No, he didn't. was not. this worldly person making these connections beyond religion, not excluding them, but just going beyond them to draw those lines of connection across the globe and then beyond <clears> across <throat> the globe, across the psyche and within the psyche that way. So, um, okay. you know, in the way that like he had just been exposed to an atom smasher or something like that, yes, these yes. technologies were <clears throat> just up and coming at the time, which shows how ahead of his time he was mm -hmm. because you know, his thoughts are being formed by the epoch of his age, but at the same time, mm -hmm. they're, they were a long time coming before that. Yes, they were. And uh, let me just mention one other quibble I have about Teilhard there. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is going to be something that a lot of people admire him for. Mm -hmm. And that was his dedication, close affiliation with his Roman Catholic mm -hmm tradition mm -hmm. okay i mean i get it i understand it but on the other hand especially as somebody who thinks in terms of billions of years sure. how come he doesn't understand that systems are supposed to be broken down mm. okay they're not supposed to be around forever right that is part of creation is the destruction of the old mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, I certainly can't judge the guy, but he just hung in there. Yeah. Even when he was being pounded over the head. Yeah. And, you know, again, Jesus, he says, if you have new wine, mm -hmm. you need new wineskins. Right. And he goes out to spell it. He goes on to spell it. He said, don't just keep patching up the old wineskins. Yeah. You know, be grateful for what they've done. Mm hmm but move on. Let me share one quick story on that. Um, years ago, I ran into a man, he was a priest, who had been uh, the superior general of his religious order. Mm -hmm. I won't mention what it was because I don't know if I have the uh, permission to do that. But That's the statute of limitations. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. I think so. He... he was, wasn't going to imagine me sharing this on a blog uh, sure, 20 sure. years later. But he was talking about how his uh, religious congregation in the country of England had virtually disappeared. Mm -hmm. The seminaries had shut down. The schools had shut down. The churches had shut down. And I'm thinking with an old mindset here, that he must be upset about this. And I said, well, Father, I said, um, how does that make you feel? And he looked at me with a very peaceful demeanor, and he said something that you probably have to be English to appreciate that. But he said, innings well played, in other words, from his comparison to playing cricket, mm -hmm. at the end of the game, it was a good game. Right. We didn't do anything wrong. Right. It's just, we did our best. It's just, it's over yeah. in this form. So 
a man or a woman with faith, mm -hmm. true faith, I think, can let the old forms go and not with a sense of nostalgia. Right. Like, oh, isn't that a shame? Right. But let it be, God. Right. Bring forth something new. Yeah. If I can offer my own perspective on Teilhard's perspective on that. Please. I think that, at least my understanding of it, is that so much of <clears throat> Teilhard, as we know, is within the details and how he defines things. Yes. And I think that as you read over the course of his writings, not within anything specific, um, but he talks about the Christian. Yes. Right? yes. And then there's this quote where he says, the Christian of the future <clears throat> will be a mystic or they will not exist at all. Right? Was, was that, that Carl Rahner? That was Rahner. Yeah, yeah. ah, okay. okay. A friend of Teilhard and certainly influenced <laughs> by it, but here I am mixing things up. That's okay. But I take that Rahner quote and I think to Teilhard to also play up something that like Richard Rohr has talked about where like true religion, true Christianity is not confessional. It's not saying I believe this, this, and that, right? It's transformational. It's living that. It's being that. And in my reading of Teilhard, when he is talking about the Christian, specifically like the Christian of the future in a way, because yes. all of Teilhard to an extent, as much as it is as rooted in the past and this deep multi-billion year history, it's all forward facing. Because yes. I think it was de Lubach who said that all of Teilhard's writing is one big meditation on death, that final <laughs> transformation or something like that. Okay. But, um, <clears throat> you know, to think that there is something there in his definition of the Christian that is perhaps more expansive, inclusive than our current understanding of church as it is now and Christianity as it is now. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if we were to see a few million years from now, mm -hmm. if we were right or wrong, like, you know, that kind of thing, like yeah. it may, may be very different. Um, and That's I think true. too, personally, <clears throat> he had his own conviction. He was called to be a priest. Mm -hmm. He had women who were interested in him. He had yeah. viable career paths outside of yes, did. just being, you know, a, a, a cleric. Yet <clears throat> he found that for him, that was the path that brought him closer to the Omega point. Yeah. And I can only think that that was maybe, I don't know if projected is the word, but mm -hmm. maybe hoped for mm -hmm. in those who make those vows and make those promises mm -hmm. that this was something that was not to an escapism right. or, you know, an easy path in life, but was one's true calling, as he says, to embrace mm -hmm. that road of fire, to know that if this is really your authentic path, whether sure. you're a parent or a priest or whatever mm -hmm. it is that you do yeah. in the world, it's true. if this path is authentic for you, then it's going to, like you said, break you over the coals to an extent, mm -hmm. test you, oh, yeah. and really break away that which is inauthentic to get to that shining divine core there okay that's very so, beautiful Andrew well th thank you I mean that's just you know <laughs> a, as I explore his thought and as yeah. I really meditated <clears throat> on it and meditate on it and just look at the world and like you said think about my kids and envision the future mm -hmm. I can only think that it's something bigger than my little monkey mind can process so <laughs> I have to kind of like open the valves and just let those creative juices flow to be able to envision that Okay. Describe it. So, okay, fantastic. But, <laughs> I think you've converted me. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to seem like this, you know, uh, rose-colored glasses no, optimist understand. either. But mm -hmm. um, and knowing the hell that Teilhard lived through, oh boy, you know. So and the unknown too of like, not, like we said, not having the science, not having even the social language to explain some things that we have now. Yeah, you know, he. I would think he would still be ahead of his time. Today. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, he still is. Right. You know, it's the old story. You know, it's not that Christianity has failed. It's never been tried. Yeah. And with Teilhard, that brings me to an interesting point I'd like to get in here. I'm not sure how much time we have. That's just, okay. Well, just to... Uh, let's have... The, we'll, we'll write it out with this, and then we'll... All right. Fair tell enough. Tell people where to find you. And, all right. That's fair enough. This is like a question. Mm -hmm. If you and I... And these hundreds or thousands of people out there have mm -hmm. been so moved by Teilhard. Mm -hmm. How come more people aren't? Mm -hmm. When I first came across them, I thought, well, this is it. Once people hear this, yeah. uh, Christianity is going to say, all right, uh, now we get it. Right. Uh, how can we deny it? 
this is the answer to everything we've been looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I thought the same thing about Jung, and that didn't work out either. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, and I think it's because some people are still identifying religion and spirituality and uh, maybe thinking that they can't get beyond that. Yeah. They don't understand the difference, for example, between Jesus and Christ. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, how come we don't have, like, and I'm not being facetious here. Yeah. How come millions of people mm -hmm. aren't listening <laughs> to this blog today? Yeah. Um, sure, yeah. I, I think that, um, and this is something we've touched on a couple times, Teilhard and people like him, they break the paradigm. Okay. They big, break the paradigm of how people have understood religion. They bust those new wineskins, <clears throat> and it kind of creates like a short circuiting within the psyche, where it's just nope, can't do it. Okay. Heresy. Yeah. Uh, it's new age. It's going to lead yeah. you down a bad spiritual path. You'll be, yeah. you know, practicing yoga and you know crystals out and stuff like that. It's like, hold on. Yeah. I didn't say anything about any of that stuff. Right. I don't know how it really connects. I don't know what's <laughs> wrong in and of itself of those things. But somehow it's being projected upon that which is offered from. That's right. And I think that um, there is a collective, again, we want to think big history here. Yes. There's a collective immaturity in our psyche. Yes. Where like <clears throat> that image, that um, the metaphor that is used of a pot boiling, right? When the water is heated, you only have a few bubbles that rise at first before you yes. really start to get to a, a rolling boil okay. and things really start to cook. <clears throat> so that's what makes me anxious is like, oh, come on, like let's yeah. let's okay. get things moving here. But I mean, the more I live, and this is, again, goes back to what you said before about that personal universal, right? Yes. yes. Which is ironically, <clears throat> or maybe not so much, a term that Teilhard uses to describe the ultimate Christ, the total Christ, the cosmic <clears throat> Christ, the personal universal. That which is most personal is also most ubiquitous and universal. Um, as I live my own life and have hope, I just see these small changes <clears throat> yes. in myself, in my family, <clears throat> in my wider family. It's true. Not just like stuff that has happened for granted, yeah. but because of the work we've put in, because mm. of the mud that we've had to work through in the past yeah we've been able to build on that <clears throat> not have anything be lost mm -hmm. and to continue to grow in a conscious relationship with each other good now like i speak most honestly about <clears throat> like my parents for example any child parent relationship faces that dynamic to some extent right mm -hmm. so now i'm having like children of my own i see there's an evolution <laughs> taking place or i say mm -hmm. to my wife I'll bet. <laughs> i just want them to be better off than we are smarter more loving more aware more compassionate that's more right. service oriented right so that's what gives yes. me hope not okay. personally universal so very good yeah. and again you know my final point then from jesus as always you know content with just planting seeds yeah. like who the heck do we think we are mm -hmm. that we expect to see results that's not for us to say right be in, just let it be enough that you keep planting seeds. Oh, but it's been 2,000 years. Again, go back. It might be another 200,000 years yeah. before we awaken. Right. And, you know, the 10 generations or 20 generations from your children. Mm -hmm. And all you can be is the best Andrew Rossi that you can be today. And we'll leave the rest into the hands of God. Amen. 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 So, so what would you say then is Teilhard's greatest contribution to the church? All right, let me be you know real simple on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, showing that there is no essential contradiction mm -hmm. between science and spirituality. Yeah. Now, you know, of course, the devil's in the details and Teilhard spells all that stuff out. But for years and years, let's face it, that was what you had to choose between yeah and uh, I could never do that mm -hmm. to me any vision had to be inclusive mm -hmm. of science psychology and spirituality right and uh, Teilhard you know did that mm -hmm. and 
I can remember sitting on the front steps of the dormitory where I was up at Fordham. And I'm not trying to be a name dropper here, but we had some great professors at the time. And Brother David Steindlerast oh, sure. came out you know, wearing blue jeans, I think, and he just sat down next to me. And I told him that I thought these three things had to fit together. And I said, what do you think about that? I said, because if you tell me they don't, mm -hmm. I'm going to go check myself in to a mental hospital. <laughs> and I think I would have. Mm -hmm. But he said, no, no, you're on the right track. These yeah. things do. So yeah. Teilhard was a great bridge builder. Mm -hmm. And I hope one day he is given the title of Doctor of the Church. Yeah. Well, I know Sister Kathy Duffy has that petition going. Oh, great. Um, well, I don't know if she's the one that started it, but she's certainly, you know, shared it through the ATA for um, people to sign on to. So I should have known. Uh, no, <laughs> we, we can we could get a link actually up in the show notes for this podcast <clears throat> so our listeners and viewers can go on and put their signature on that as well. Um, for what it's worth, you know, it, sure. anything it, furs, it furthers his mission, like we said, in the vision. Um, so, Tom, thank you so much for this conversation today. It's been a pleasure. It's been uh. an honor. I hope that, like you said, our listeners get something from it. I know just being able to dialogue with you in this way has brought up even more questions <clears> to <throat> me about Teilhard, about things to ponder. So it's been a pleasure. And um, would you mind telling our audience where they can find you, how they might be able to get in touch with you? Um, yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I do have a website. Uh, it's called TomLegere.com. Nothing too fancy. <laughs> Again, I'm a simple guy. And uh, that will let you know a lot of the programs uh, that I am still able to offer, even at this fast advancing age of mine. So you can do that. Uh, also, I want to let you know about the latest book that I'm working on. It's pretty well put together right now. And when you hear the title, you say, well, okay, I can understand why Tom would choose that title. It's called 12-Step Spirituality Made Simple. Okay, I've been turned down by a couple publishers because it's too simple. <laughs> so <laughs> it's out there with another publisher. If anybody knows of a publisher who might be interested in looking at something like that, uh, you can get in touch with me uh, through my website. So all of us in, in the newosphere and in the Christosphere or the theosphere, you ever want to call it, we are all on the same wavelength and we're all planting seeds together. So thank you folks for listening and thank you Andrew for doing this great work. It was truly uh, a privilege for me. And enjoy. Likewise, Tom. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for all the wisdom, insight, knowledge, personal experiences you shared. And thank you to all of our listeners, viewers, however you are connecting with us. We are grateful for your support. You can find us and support us online. Find the American Tayard Association, tayardbaychardin.org. Yes. We are on Facebook. We are on Instagram. And the podcast is found pretty much anywhere you can listen to a podcast on Spotify, Google, so forth and so on. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you next time.